my soul and all that is within me hallelujah amen what a privilege what an honor to be able to read from god's word this morning it is not of a ritual but it is a blessing and it's a privilege it's an honor to be able to read god's word we give him thanks this morning as pastor said i'll be reading from first kings chapter 12 verses 1 through 17 and it reads thus far Rehoboam sent to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nabat, heard this, he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they went for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, go away for three days, then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servant. But, Re but Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, 
tell these people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly. Rejecting the advice given him by the elders, he followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. For this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Our subject this morning, our subject this morning that we'll be dealing with our topic of the message is a few bad actors. A few bad actors. This is a term that we've been hearing quite frequently as we listen to the news. And uh, the Lord has dropped this word into my spirit this past week. And in order to understand clearly or, or fully understand who are bad actors, I looked into the dictionary and believe it or not, I found a definition for bad actors. The definition described bad actors as persons who are unruly, persons who are turbulent, contentious, or troublemakers. These persons who move against the norms, these are persons who move against the norms in society. And let me just pause for a moment and say thank you so much, Reverend Sandra, for the reading. Appreciate your uh, participating in this manner. Uh, oftentimes, these bad actors move against the norms in society. They operate from a position at times of ignorance. And other times, they intentionally disregard the past or they may disregard wise counsel. One subject that we can never have too much of is the subject of history. And I've discovered that I have a, a real passion for history because if we don't know our past, we tend to repeat it. If we don't know the mistakes that were made in the past, we repeat them as well. The reason being, everything about not the natural world is constantly changing. What, we did, what I've discovered in thinking about this, this matter is human social settings are constantly changing. And we can go into a whole list of social settings that are constantly changing. Technology is constantly changing. With respect to, for example, recorded song, when we think about the past 75 years or so, thinking about song, we had the gramophone. Then from the gramophone, we went to the vinyl 33s and 45s. And we went from the 33s and the 45s to the eight track recordings. And from the eight track recordings, and I'm, I, think, I think I'm not talking to some of the persons who are younger, probably in their 30s. Because anyone who is in their 30s or even their 40s may not even know what an eight track recorder is. We went then to the cassette tape. <laughs> and from the cassette tapes, we went to the CDs. And I have a whole stack of CDs in the house that I just don't even know what to do with them. All gospel music, however. We went from the CDs to the MP3s. And now we have gone to, re to recording sound electronically. Change is happening constantly in the world. 
In fact, the only constants in the world, as I thought about it, as I meditated upon it, are God, God is never changing, and history does not change. We can do many things with the past, but you can do nothing to change the facts of history. And those of you who are teachers and who are in uh, education, you know how history can be uh, altered and tainted. But we can do lots of things with history, but we can't change it. We can reflect on history or we can deny history. We can disregard history or we can regard history, regret, sorry, regret history. We can also admit history and learn from it, and, uh, but we cannot change history. Now, spiritually speaking, only God can change the past. Spiritually speaking, only God can change the past because he's sovereign. And there's nothing that God cannot do. Also, when we think of the fact that he takes our sinful lifestyles and he cleans us up, he takes our sinful actions. And when we repent of our sins, God cleans us up. And in his eyes, he makes us as pure as we have, like we have never sinned in the past. Only God can do this. Now, I want you to take note of this statement that, that I'm going to be sharing now. If you don't receive anything else in this message today, I want you to receive this. I want you to understand it. All right? We cannot change the past. We cannot change our past actions. We cannot change our successes. Children, the young people are finishing with their classes. When you have been given your grade, there's nothing or no one that can possibly change that grade after your grade has been officially submitted. And if you fail in your studies, if you fail in your exams, there's nothing and no one that can change that failure. But what you can do is study harder. You don't understand what I'm saying yet. Speaking generationally, rather, speaking generationally, our future is behind us. Make a note of that statement. That is, the generations of younger people who are coming behind us will eventually determine the lives that we will live as older folks. And I think you're getting a clear picture now. So that speaking generationally, our future, the future of the United States, lies in the hands of those generations who are behind us. Eventually, they will determine many things in the world when it comes to us, when we become senior. Now, the generations that are behind us will design and uh, will design our, our, our laws for the future. And they will be our lawyers. The generation behind us will be our doctors. They will be our architects. They will be our scientists. They will be our builders. They will be our educators. Therefore, the worldview of our younger people, of the generation behind us, is critically important. What the young people who are behind us, the generation that is coming behind us, what they believe is very important. How they believe what they believe is critically important. And how they interpret life will impact future generations. In our text, in our text, the truth is displayed, is displayed, this truth is played out vividly in 1 Kings chapter 12. Solomon, the master builder of Jerusalem, the city of David, had a son by the name of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was his son. And because of Solomon's dis disobedience, because he intermarried with so many foreign wives, because he engaged in idolatry, the Lord told Solomon that he was going to rend the kingdom from his hands, but he was going to leave a tribe for the sake of David. He wasn't doing it for the sake of Solomon, but he was going to do it for the sake of David. Now, the first mistake that, that uh, Rehoboam made was instead of asking the Lord for direction, he asked the people for direction. The word of God says to seek first, not second, seek first the kingdom of God. We are to seek God's direction in everything we do. doesn't matter what others 
are doing around us. Doesn't matter what opinions others may have. We need to get to know the voice of God and seek his counsel. God never intended for his rule over Israel to be a democratic uh, rule. God wanted to be sovereign over his people Israel. But the people observed all of the other nations around them. And then they came to the prophet Samuel and they said, Samuel, we want to be just like the people around us. We want a king. And, and they, what they actually did in doing that was they rejected God. In a democracy, the various groups in a democracy, there may be two groups, there may be three groups in a democracy, these groups are always seeking to satisfy their own interests. We are living in society, in a society that is considered or under government that is called a, a democratic, democratic republic. And even in our country, in our nation, we see there are people in Washington, there are people in places of authority who are constantly seeking their own personal interests. In a democratic system of government, uh, corruption always tends to seep in to this type of government. We, we, we claim that this is the best form of government. It is the, a, probably a fairer form of government rather than a dictatorship. But in a democracy, there is always room for corruption to seep in. What happens in a democracy often is that the group with the most money gets their way, gets to have their way. And this is why it happens so much in our society, where we have special interest groups who all they do, all they do as a profession is they go into Washington, they go into places of government, and then they have monies, big money supporting them, and they pay the politicians off to, re, to, to alter the laws and to change the rules to accommodate their particular special interests or their particular industries. In one sense, oftentimes in a democracy, the, the largest group has the sway. But the thing, I, the problem that I have with this is that the largest group is not always correct. The largest group is not, not always, does not always follow the ways that are best for the people in general, or the ways that are best and honorable to God. Rehoboam received counsel from the older people. As he ascended the throne, he asked the older, older people what should he do. And those ones who were who were there working with his father, those ones who shed their sweat and their blood, their tears, building this splendid kingdom. They felt that they needed a rest. They felt that the kingdom was, was established. The various structures were built. Solomon's temple was completed. And everyone was satisfied with the material goods that they had. The kingdom was so great that one day, the, one, one season, the queen of Sheba came and visited Solomon. And the queen of, of Sheba, after Solomon showed her this great kingdom, she was, she was overwhelmed by what she saw. And she said to Solomon, you know, Solomon, I have heard so much about this great kingdom that you have built, that your father instructed you to build. But the truth is that the half has still not yet been told because no one can come and see your whole kingdom expect, except they spend a large uh, num a number of weeks or days or months overviewing the whole kingdom. Now, the older people advise King Rehoboam to make their work a bit easier. Everyone needs a little break. When we reached ages 70 and 75 years old, we don't want to be working like when we were 25 and 30 years old. And it makes good sense to give the people some rest. Since the kingdom was established, uh, uh, Rehoboam was on, his, was on the throne because Solomon had died, everything was going fine. And if he was a good politician, he would have taken this counsel. But he told the older folks, listen, give me three days and I'm going to bring you back after I consult with some other folks and I will make a decision. So what's, what Rehoboam did was he got some younger people who grew up with him. Younger folks who did not know what it was to cut stone. Younger folks who did not know what it was to work day and night building the structures that were in this great kingdom. These younger people 
said to Solomon as the text reads in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 8 through 11, but Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders that the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He contacted his homies, he contacted his homeboys, and uh, he asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put upon us? Verse 10 lets us know that the young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now then, now tell them, my little finger is thicker than your father's waist. And uh, my father laid on you a heavy yoke, and I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, and I will scourge you with scorpions. In other words, these young men were insensitive to the needs of the people. These young men were, 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 were not tolerant to the, to the heavy yoke that was played upon, that was placed upon the older people who had built this great kingdom. What happened as a result? The kingdom of Israel, the great kingdom of Israel was divided. It was divided in two because the, 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 uh, the, the older folks who were at that time being led or, or, or instructed by Jeroboam, a man whom the Lord put his hands upon and selected him to lead Israel. The kingdom was divided in two tribes and the kingdom was divided into Je Ju uh, Ju Judah and Benjamin, which comprised of the uh, northern kingdom, the, sorry, the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, and the other 10 tribes followed Jeroboam and they formed the northern kingdom of Israel. As a result of these bad actors, what we saw here were a few bad actors who impacted the whole nation. We must not take for granted when we have a group of people who are concerned with their own interests, a group of people with their own special interests, because we can learn a couple of things and apply them to our lives in this current climate in which we are in. We can learn that the slave master and the greedy, uh, they never have enough. The slave master and the greedy never have enough. We have some wealthy oligarchs in our country. Where the more they have, the more they want. Greed is never satisfied. To quote B.C. Forbes, he says, the man who has one millions at the cost of his conscience is a failure. The man who has taken millions at the cost of his conscience is a failure. I also like what Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi said. He said, earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greeds. Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. The word of God lets us know that God has promised to supply all of our needs, not all of our greeds, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Secondly, we can also learn that you can oppress a people for so long, for a long time, but they won't remain oppressed forever. Because when the people saw that they had no part in the kingdom, they just walked away and left King Rehoboam with a smaller number of people, and they formed their own government there in the north. When the oppressed cry out, the Lord hears, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. The Bible lets us know that the, the, the Hebrews were in Egypt for 430 years. But the scriptures lets us know that God heard their cries. He heard their cries, and he raised up the deliverer Moses and they were brought out of oppression. The Babylonians held the children of Israel because of disobedience for 70 years. But when that time had expired, the judgment of God came upon their oppressors, the Persian king, and he brought deliverance to them. The African-Americans were subjugated to discrimination. 
we have been subjugated to racial prejudice. And if you took some time to see the many YouTube and Facebook postings of innocent men being shot, innocent men being killed at the hands of insensitive men and women in authority. We see it all around. We have seen, we have been kept out of uh, proper housing. African Americans have been given substandard education. We have not been able to secure loans from banks. Our young men were shot in the back. They were shot in the, with their hands up. They were shot running away. They were shot standing up. They were choked from the front. They were strangled from the back. They were hung from a tree and they were killed under the knee. But I've come to let God's people know today, I am convinced, I am convinced that it has come to an end. I am convinced that this oppression, these senseless murders of innocent people have come to an end. Justice has come in the form of body cameras. Justice has come in the form of cellular phones. And this is why change is good, because change sheds light, light on the things that needs to be seen. Only God knows, only God knows how many innocent men and women have been killed because the acts, these acts of these criminal acts were not recorded. I was listening to the news the, the other day. And I and I there's a there's a gentleman who re, who who documents who documents the activities the, the criminal the murders of 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 criminal of so not criminals of police officers in this country, and he said that in uh, the same state, in uh, the same state where this incident occurred, there were over there were thousands thousands of cases where men were killed at the hands of police officers. But there was only one instant where a police officer was found guilty in many, many years. And the first time a police officer was found guilty for the murder of a citizen, that police officer happened to be an officer of color. And that person that died happened to be a Caucasian woman. Now, I don't know, I don't know where the conscience of our justice system is. I don't know where the conscience of even some of our police officers are. We heard recently that 57 police officers walked away from their jobs in Buffalo because they didn't like to be held accountable. They wanted to move to another department. People of God, the morning has come. The Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I've come to let you know today, and I, 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 am, I don't consider myself a prophet, but I'm letting you know that this situation is coming to an end. The morning time is here. Morning is here. Mothers have cried. Fathers have cried. Brothers have cried. Sisters have cried for their loved ones. Children have cried for their parents, and they're still crying for their loved ones. But I thank God that Psalm 37, verse 17 says that the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them from all of their troubles. I believe that this season is bringing about a shift in our justice system. This season is bringing a shift in our law enforcement, uh, in our, the law enforcement system in our country. But what else can we learn from this? We can also learn that God always vindicates the righteous. God always vindicates the righteous. For three years, Colin Kilpatrick stood up for what was right. He watched the oppression of his people and he acted. The people around him criticized him. They defamed him. 
They said uh, if he didn't like uh, what was happening in the country, he shall find another country to go and to live in. The president uh, called this young man, uh, this young, honorable, respectable young man, uh, an SOB. I can't repeat those words, but you know what it means. Then the NFL followed the president's advice and eventually fired him. You don't have to fire a person. All you have to do is to not hire them, and they're automatically fired. For three years, a top football player in the NFL, and he could not get a job. It reminds me so much of what happens in the grassroots areas of our nation. We have people who are fully qualified, people with excellent uh, attendance records, people with no criminal records, people who are great producers of their various skills and talents and gifts. But when they look up, there's always a glass ceiling. And that glass ceiling has been put there because of the complexion of their skin. But I've come to let you know today, it is coming to an end. Like Moses, Colin saw the suffering of his people and he saw the injustice that was being perpetrated against his people and he could not stay quiet. He took a knee, hallelujah. He took a knee. He gave his job. He gave up his career. He gave up his salary. He gave up his good name. And Moses did the same thing. For the Bible lets us know in Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 25, that Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. But now the pleasures, now the pressure's on. Now the stadiums are empty. The monies are gone. And they are coming to their senses. We heard the president of the NFL, George Goodell, came out with a statement and he apologized because he now realizes that they were wrong. He doesn't realize that they were wrong because of the principle of the matter. If he could keep this man out of a job for three years, believe you me, he doesn't realize that he is wrong because of the principle of injustice. He realizes that he was wrong because of money that was in his pocket. The money that was flowing to the NFL is not flowing there any longer. You just keep all the people of color out of these stadiums and you'll see what they would have. So they came out with a statement that they were wrong. Unbelievable, they were wrong. Now, if they were really wrong, they will compensate this man for three years of salary. If they recognize that they were really wrong, they can afford to do it. If they recognize that we're really, they were really weren't wrong, they will make sure that this man, if he wants to play again, has a team on which he can play. If they realize that they were really wrong, they would also recognize that this country was built on the blacks, on the backs of African slaves. This country was built due to the sweat of people of color. The White House was built by slaves. And it is time that the people of color, the only people who have never received any form of reparations, in fact, the, few, the very few times that people of color determined to build, build for themselves, build a city for themselves, they were bombed. They were bombed in Arkansas. They were bombed in North Carolina. If this nation really recognizes the wrong that they have done, they will get them, their, their acts together. But I want to let you know this morning, hope, there's hope, because First Lady and I, and as you have been seeing, we are not standing alone. We are with a group of people, a generation who are behind us, the generation the millennial generation are outnumbering the people of color on the streets during these protests. We were in Hempstead two days ago, and we were amazed to see the support that African Americans were, were, were receiving. 
as they protested on the streets. People from as far as Garden City were coming in in large numbers. People are protesting in the Caribbean because of the injustices that have been perpetrated against the Africans that were taken out of their country. People are protesting in white Europe. People are protesting around the world. We are not alone. And like I said before, like I said before, the generation that is behind us, my God, is making the difference for us. Because when we marched in Staten Island in 2016, when we saw the senseless killing of Eric Garner, we marched, we protested, but nothing happened. You know why nothing happened? Because we were standing alone, but change is coming. The eyes of our young people have become opened and their hearts are being touched by the truth of this injustice and change is on the way. Listen, we have a few bad actors in places of power, but those few bad actors will soon find that the majority will turn their backs to them as, as the majority turned their backs to King Rehoboam. He was a kingdom, he was the king over almost nothing. He just had Judah and Benjamin with him, but the other 10 tribes headed north and followed Jeroboam. A few bad actors in our society better wake up. They better wake up. What is the message today? What is the message today? All it takes are a few bad, bad actors to destroy a good thing. All it takes are a few bad actors to destroy a good thing. A good thing. Israel was strong as a nation together, but these young men who were concerned only about themselves, destroyed and divided the great nation Israel. And we have a few bad actors who have divided this nation, who would still love to see these statues that represent the division of our nation standing. But you know what? They should pull them all down. They should burn them on the rubble heap because they only stoke the flames of hatred. They only stoke the flames of racism. They only stoke the flames of injustice in our nation. The definition of a bad actor, as we said before, one who is unruly, one who is turbulent, one who is contentious, a troublemaker. These bad actors gave Rehoboam bad advice. But listen, Time, the time has come. The time has come to put the pressure on. And I want to let you know, as you know, the pressure is on. The pressure is on. Does this sound familiar to you? Does this sound familiar to you? The people have had enough. Not only have the people of color had enough in this country, but the people, the new generation, the young generation have had enough. We've had people come to us. First Lady said some of her co-workers called her up and apologized to her. They have said, I did not know that this is what African Americans were going through. We're talking about not children, adults. Because many of these Caucasian people live in a bubble. They live in a bubble. The only time they see us is when they see us committing crime on the streets. When we look at the postings on Facebook, you see that the only ones that are being portrayed, portrayed as looters are people of color. But it is not just the looters, the people of color that are looting. Yes, there are people of color who are looting, but all the people were looting as well. Bunch of bad actors, bad actors. Now we thank God. The word of God lets us know that he will cause even our enemies to be at peace with us. We were really, really encouraged to see in Hempstead, Long Island, that there were more Caucasians standing and protesting on the streets of, of Hempstead than there were people of color. Not that there weren't many of us there as well. Everyone is coming together. The bad actors have tried to divide our nation. But that division, those walls of division are coming down. 
The bad actors are trying to build walls around the nation to keep the very people who are producing and working almost for free. They're trying to keep them out. But the walls are coming down. People are coming together. The blacks are coming together with the Caucasians. The Indians are coming together with the blacks and the Caucasians. My God, the Latinos have come together. The Asians are coming out. There's a unity in this country. And I, and I dare to say, as Martin Luther King uh, Jr. said, the 11 o'clock hour is the most divided hour in our nation. Because we will say, in God we trust. We will declare that we love the Bible. We can walk to the front of the churches and say that I believe in God or I believe in this book. But if we don't open the book and read the book, if we don't love the words that are written in the book to penetrate our hearts, if we don't allow the word of God to bring about change in our lives, change in our perspective, we will always be living with hate and division among us. But I've come to let you know this morning that change has come. Change is not coming. Change is here. Change is here. There's a common clause that says, liberty and justice for all. The time has come. The time has come. There are a few bad actors that caused the United Nation of Israel to be divided. And there are a few bad actors that have caused our nation to be divided. But people, I have a word for you. Election day is coming. Hallelujah. Election day is in November. Hallelujah. Change is coming. I can't tell you who to vote for, but you know who to vote for. Common sense will tell you who to vote for. Common sense will let you know that, that they have to take the knees out of our necks. They have to loose God's people from these choke holes. They have to take the bullets out of their guns or else bullets will be going into our guns as well. And I'm not advocating violence. I'm not advocating violence today. I come to let you know, the Bible says that the wicked rule, when the wicked rule, the people groan. But when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Don't give up. A day of rejoicing is here. It's coming and it is here. Do not relent. The day of rejoicing is on its way. In closing, the most difficult days for us are up ahead. You know why the most difficult days for us are up ahead? Because the slave master and the oppressor doesn't like to see the oppressed go free. Just as much as we are experiencing the joy and the, the freedom of liberation, an opportunity to stand with a broad majority to let our voices be heard, there are those who are sitting behind the scenes and they are angry, they are mad. It reminds me of the day when the children of Israel were liberated and Pharaoh realized that they had allowed these slaves, these slaves that washed their, dis their dishes, these slaves that cleaned their clothes, these slaves that built their houses, that planted their vineyards, these, these slaves that took care of all of their animals, they recognized that these slaves were no longer there to do the slave work for them, and he got angry. Listen, I warn you, I caution you, difficult days ahead. In the days and months ahead, it will be said that we are to blame for our situation. Some have already said that we are to blame for our situation. If you remember when Pharaoh went to, to, to when, when Moses went to Pharaoh and told him the word of God to let my people go, what did he say? These people are lazy. This is a word that has been put upon our people. They said, let them lift themselves up by their own bootstraps. They have not given us proper education. 
They have not allowed us to live in proper homes. They have infiltrated our communities with drugs. They go on the outside of our schools and they sell our young men drugs. They have a prison industrial complex that is saturated with the lives of our young people. Though we only make up 13% of this population, but I've come to let you know today that better days, better days are coming. Better days are coming. And as I, as I, as I close the final points, finally three points of application. How can we apply what is happening to our situation today? How can we apply this, this situation that occurred in 1 Kings chapter 12 today? The first thing that we can do is don't think about yourself alone. Consider yourself your brother's keeper. If these, this new generation, if this new generation that is going to influence our future did not consider the plight of the African American, our voices will still not be heard. A shot was fired, my God, and is being heard around the world. Change is coming. We cannot think of ourselves alone. We cannot be selfish. Secondly, Learn from your past. And if you don't have a past, learn from history. These young people did not appreciate how hard the seniors worked to build this kingdom for, uh, for, Sam, for, for Solomon and for Rehoboam because they were not there. They could not appreciate it. So I, I implore you, discover your history. The Caucasian people who came and apologized personally for the acts of injustice against people of color were either ignorant of the facts of the history or they were asleep somewhere. But we need to know our history because when we learn our history, we will not make the mistakes of the past. And thirdly, listen to other people's opinions but move with godly counsel. Listen to other people's views and opinions because the word of God lets us know in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. So listen to the voices, but make your decision based upon godly counsel that comes from the word of God. And if this man, Rehoboam, had only considered the past. If he had looked at the past deliverance of God, of the people of Israel, he would not make this bad decision. I implore the people of God today to begin giving God thanks for what he is doing. You know what happened as I considered this whole scenario? We have had a perfect storm that has, that has brought these events to pass. A perfect storm, COVID-19, came on the scene. What it did was it locked people out of the schools. It shut people out of their places of work. And the people were, were there available to go out and to protest. The next thing that happened, unfortunately, was George Floyd's death was, was uh, occurred and it was a public event. Thank God for Facebook. Thank God for social media. Because if this little girl was not there with her camera, this would have just been another event. This would have just been another report as what happened in there in Atlanta and other places. A perfect storm. If the people were working, if they were on the, in the schools, we would not have had this large outpour of people in the streets. But I want to encourage the people of God to stay strong, stay the course, do not destroy your own property, do not go out and vandalize other people's property, but stay on course because a, sla a slave master can only be a slave master if he has slaves. The moment the slaves have been liberated, the moment the slaves have been freed, he's just like everyone else. And the anger will rage 
the animosity will rage. They will walk on the streets uh, and they will go in the stores and buy guns. But if they have no one to shoot at, the guns will sit on their racks and they will rust. Stay within the limits of the law, but stay the course because there are bad, a few bad actors out there who have corrupted this nation for over 400 years. We still have some bad actors that needs to be removed out of office. And all it takes is a pen. Hallelujah. All it takes is one vote collectively and change is coming in your situation. Let's look to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we give you praise and glory. We thank you, oh God, for the illustrations, the history that is outlined in your word. We see there, God, that heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of your truth will not come to pass. Your word says that weeping may endure for a night. Hallelujah. But joy always comes in the morning. This is not only a season of, 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 of COVID-19, but this is also a season of liberation. The glass, as it is half full, today, it is, as it is half empty, it is half full as well. And the people of color in this country, the people with a conscience are standing up and they're speaking up for what is right and what is just and what is true. And God, you are a God not only of righteousness, but you are a God of justice. And Lord, you are exercising your justice in the streets of our nations. You are exercising justice in the places of power. And my God, we know that this is just the beginning of liberation. It took 10 plagues for Israel to be liberated from Egypt. And Lord, this is just the beginning of the process of liberation. But God, right now we pray against the bad actors, the bad actors in places of power, the bad actors in places of authority, the bad actors who are only concerned with their own wealth, their own position, their, their own accumulation of power. And so, Father, we know, dear God, that the righteous cries, and the Lord always hears, and you always deliver us from all of our troubles. And so, Lord, we cast in all our cares upon you today, because we know that you care for us. And Father, we pray for every family in our nation today who has experienced the loss of a loved one unjustly. We pray for the families of the Eric Garners, oh God, the families of George Floyd, my God. We pray for the many children who have been traumatized by the loss of a father or a mother at the hands of those who are being paid to protect them. God, we pray that their hearts will be, in, will be encouraged by God at the result of the events of the days, the events that have just have recently occurred. We pray that God, we as a people, not only the people of color, but the people of God, the people with conscience, the people who will call right, right, and wrong, wrong, will stand together. And that once again, our nation will be great. Yes, we can make America great again when we stand on the side of God. Yes, we will make America great again. When justice, hallelujah, runs, runs down like a river, we're going to believe God for change. And we're looking, we're looking to see it happen in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. And amen. The Lord bless you all. And thank you for being with us today on this Amen. precious day. Amen. Hallelujah. Be